So we'll record. So today um, I'm going to um, uh, let let everybody unmute themselves because today is actually just uh, an open session in which I wanted to just entertain any questions people had. So I don't have any anything in particular to show you. Uh, just you know, what questions do you have? What things have issues have you come across or? You know, do you have any of those, how would I do this uh, type of question? Well, this is Robert here. I yep. don't have any questions right now because I'm not actively working on a case right now. So I would, I'm probably going to step away from this thing because I want to come to you with specific okay. questions. So I have. In that, in that case, I'll wish you a happy weekend. Well, let me, let me just show you one little thing. Okay. Because it came up just uh, a half an hour ago. Somebody called in and she said, I've selected that. And this was a case where somebody was, you know, working much longer. They were much younger. And she said, I've selected the maximized checkbox for RSP contributions because for the next several years we want to maximize. But there comes a point when we don't want to maximize anymore and we may not even want to uh, contribute anything you know, how can I adjust that? So when you select maximize, you cannot then go in and adjust anything. If you try and save it, it'll snap back to the, the maximized calculation. Behind each of these dollar bill bundles, there's the earned income calculation for each year. So once you save it, you know, figures it all out. But the trick is very simple. All you have to do is deselect the maximize checkbox. You can click save. But now that it's deselected, the software isn't going to do the automatic calculation. It hasn't changed any of these entries, but now you have the ability to go in, for example, and, and you know, manually enter whatever you want to enter in a year. Oh, well, that's good to know. So that applies to things like RRSPs, TFSAs, et cetera. So maximize will, you know, force the calculation every year. Then all you need to do is deselect and none of the entries will change, but you can then go in and manually change the ones you want. Hmm. That's just a little tip that came up today. Uh, Michael, I have yeah. a scenario that I've been, I'm going to be working on for next week. Maybe you could help me with Sure. or the idea of it. Um, sure. If you had, say, a, a, a non-registered account with, like, just using round numbers, say, like, a million dollars, and I wanted to have a UL policy where the money was transferred from that non-registered account to the UL policy on an annual basis, how... It, 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 sorry, on an annual basis? Did yeah, you say, right? yeah. Okay, and, and, and what are you talking about here? You're talking about, uh, you know, wanting to pre-fund the policy, right? Yeah, so like, yeah, you know, they have this insurance and then, but I, the money needs to come specifically from that non-registered account, not just like the program finds money and puts it. Uh, if you set up a separate portfolio, I'll actually uh, use bills. So, um, I'll put the million dollars in Bill's portfolio and uh, we want to use it to pay the premiums. And what I'll do is on the tactics tab, I've got uh, under withdrawals, I've got Bill's non-reg portfolio deselected so that auto withdrawals aren't going to override it. And then when I go to entries in Bill's portfolio and withdrawals, Oh, sorry, I have to do that in uh, both in the pre and post retirement years. Hang on a second here. Non reg portfolio bill, deselect that. And then uh, what I'm able to do then is I'm able to go in to withdrawals and I can link it to specific expenses. So I can now link it to the level benefit UL policy. That's what I was looking for. Okay. And there you can see we had uh, put in. Uh, $5,000, I guess it is. I guess, oh, that's a policy that I have under Bill's name, not the one I created on the joint tab. So you can see there are the $5,000 premiums. So now it's linked specifically to that expense. And, and you can see 
that it, it will actually link to a whole wide range of expenses, buying sport utilities, you know, whatever it might be. And if you're overfunding the insurance policy, you use the cash value entry to put the overfunded amount? It, it, if you're overfunding, well, what you should get is you should get a policy illustration that will tell you the death benefit, the premiums, the cash value, the ACB should all be in the policy illustration. But like, projection. I get like, say the premiums are 5,000 say, and then the, the client says, well, I want to put in 10,000 to overfund into a, a cash value account or the side account. Investment. Yeah, but 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 we we won't make a calculation of what that means to the cash value, simply because every insurance uh, company is different. Yeah, I get that. But how do I show the extra amount? You 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 don't show the you you would make the you would make the premium what the premium oh. are going to be is you would make the premiums ten thousand dollars. That's what the oh. premiums are going to be. Okay. Okay. Right. So you just put in what the premiums are going to be, and then in the policy illustration it will say in, uh, in this cash value based on those premiums will be, and then you enter the cash value. And to enter the cash value, you'd go to the hopefully electronic illustration. Uh, you would select the column of uh, CSV pro projection, projected values, and then you would go here. I can't do this, but if I do a right click, if I copy the uh, CSV projected values to the computer clipboard, then this insert table will be in, uh, will be enabled because there's something on the clipboard. So then I just right click, then I left click insert table and all the CSVs that I've caught, I've copied will, uh, you know, will populate the table. Now, if you don't have an electronic version, PDF or something, all you really have to do is look at it and then go in, depending on the number of years involved, but go in and every three or five years kind of idea, type in, you know, what those numbers are going to be uh, off that PDF file that you're given. And then it'll insert the intervening numbers, you know, reasonably, uh, reasonably um, well. And then it'll be in the first few years that they won't really be equal annual amounts. You know, they'll be, it'll be one of those things where it kind of curves up. So it might be, you know, something more like this, where it's going to gradually curve up. But that's all you, that's all you really need to do. Is that clear? Yeah, very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? This is an open session. So, you know, throw questions and, uh, will you know just yeah michael just out of curiosity yeah. while we're on this uh screen mm -hmm. um if you um to do that calculation if you're if you put in the like the ten thousand dollar premiums and then you put in the net cost of pure insurance would that not make the calculation for you no we don't we don't do the calculation again because different insurance companies are different. So what we say is the only way to do this reliably is to get an illustration from the company and then just, you know, paste in the numbers that they give you in the illustration. Okay. We don't do so much NCPI anymore. Uh, it, what a, a number of advisors had said to us, this goes back, I don't know, three to five years was they said it's fairly difficult to actually get the NCPI for an insurance policy. Getting the ACB works no problem. So we left the NCPI in there just because of, you know, somebody may have done, um, a, a, a modeled an insurance policy some years ago, and that's what they have. But really it's the ACB that you wanna use now. And I can't remember the math, it's all built in, but I think it's once you, uh, the ACB uh, goes to zero, if you're taking loans, then that becomes taxable income. Anyway, it's all, it's all built into the math. Um, if you go to tactics insurance and you're, you know, you're taking down uh, loans, then, uh, 
then it's it, the math is built in to do that correctly. So it's really it's really the ACB that it that cues off of now. Is that okay? Grant, I think you you'd ask. Yes, a thank you. Oh, it's Russ. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Other um, questions? I got another one. I don't want to sure. hog time. No, it's we're here. You know, pe people have questions, and other people say, "Oh yeah, I wondered about that too." So you know, fire away. Um, with excess cash. Uh, yes. I'm trying to decide, is it better to create this non-fiction or this fictional, sorry, non-registered account or to use the main bank account for your excess cash? Do you have like, is there something that sort of you lean towards when doing Well, that? It, 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 somebody may not now have a non-registered portfolio, uh, but that doesn't mean that as a consequence of the planning work, they won't end up with one. You know, again, it might be the case, so let's just do this. It might be the case where, um, and we talked about this actually last week, I used an example where this lady was making about $220,000 a year, very straightforward what she was making, um, gave the advisor the expenses. And when we just did, here are your sources, here are your uses, what popped out for the next several years, was that she should be saving about $6,000 a year, $5,000 a month. And she wasn't, she wasn't saving anything. So, you know, we have to acknowledge that everybody has a latte factor, but in her case, it was $5,000 a month of after-tax spending. And what we bought, and, and in order for her to be able to do what she wanted to do, which was to buy a new house in a few years time, we needed to try and capture you know, a fair amount of that 60 grand a year latte factor to use to, to, towards a down payment. So what you can do, if you'll remember, is you can turn on spend excess cash and that gets rid of the latte factor. That just says, we don't know where it's going. It's just going somewhere. So it may be right now that people aren't saving any money because they're spending all excess cash but once they start to look at things and realize in their particular case that it may be very important for them to you know, start to capture some of that latte factor, that's when we can, um, uh, we can actually leave spend excess cash turned on. But what we can do is we can go into a portfolio and we can do a transfers into, which would be our transfers into now I've got the excess cash going in, but it would be the transfers into of the amount of that, in that lady's case, $5,000 a month, 60 grand a year, it would be the amount that she commits to that she's going to save. So we have our sources going into our main bank account. We have our uses coming out of it, which would include that uh, savings that we're going to capture the transfer into the portfolio and then we can still leave excess cash turned on so that the latte factors that you know three thousand dollars a month or whatever it might be so you know even though somebody doesn't have a non-reg now that doesn't mean that they're that, that uh, as part of the planning pr uh, process they're not going not going to have one so you know, we can still make excess cash go into that non-reg first. Is that too, a little too much, Ryan? No, or No, that's fine. Yeah, I, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, and then what about with couples? Do you, is it, I'm having trouble deciding, Do you know, because a lot of couples have their separate bank accounts. Yes. Um, but it's kind of easier to show it as a joint system, that's, right? That's, you're absolutely correct that's the dilemma so on the settings page you can operate with individual bank accounts and non-reg portfolios or you can operate you know with a joint bank account or joint portfolios but what you can also do is you can operate with individual bank accounts so that if i go to bill he would have his main bank account sue would have her main bank account but then what we can do is we can still have that joint non-reg 
so that we can go to excess cash and move the money into the joint non-reg instead of the individual non-reg portfolio. So we can still operate with individual bank accounts, you know, sources and uses, but then we can put any excess into the joint portfolio. One of the things that you should be aware of is that the joint portfolio is joint uh, from the point of view of joint tenant with right of survivorship, legally joint, but that doesn't mean that portfolio joint portfolios are joint from the point of view of a financial interest. The financial interest uh, being that one person makes, you know, $500,000 and the other person makes $50,000. Well, clearly it, it may be a joint portfolio but the person making 500 is much more likely to be contributing to that portfolio than the person making 50. So we can, we can say, okay, well, the actual financial interest is only 10% bill and it's 90% Sue, cause she's the one who makes all the money. Um, and then once we set that up, any cash flow excesses and withdrawals, are actually tracked in the background by VisionWorks and it will year by year update these percentages um, so that any uh, taxable income generated by the portfolio in the background will actually be split correctly to their individual tax returns. You follow me on that one? Yeah, that's that's cool. I didn't know it did that actually. So. Yeah. That's the dilemma because otherwise, if we're not doing that, we just say it's a joint portfolio and all the money goes into it and it's equally owned from a financial interest point of view, then what we would be doing is we'd be splitting the taxable income, interest, dividends, capital gains, 50-50, and then we'd be in, in contravention of the attribution rules. So we actually didn't do this for a very long time. And then when we went to the individual or went from the individual uh, bank accounts and portfolios to the joint bank account and portfolios or even the individual bank accounts but the joint portfolio where we're putting in our excess cash uh you know it was quite a bit of work for the programmer to be able to do that but again i always rave about how excellent she is and she's never not being able to do something. So that gets pretty sophisticated because it's literally year by year. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? So I think we are uncovering a few things that other people may not have known about making it worthwhile. <laughs> So let me just throw out a couple of things that, that came up in the last couple of days. I just want to make sure you're aware of this. Um, I'm going to disable or exclude um, Bill's RRSP. And what I'm going to do is create a DBP form. So I was working with somebody uh, in the last couple of days, and it was a situation where the retirement benefit, if they kept the DBP, would be about 50 $5,000 a year. But what they were doing was looking at commuting it. So I just want to make sure you're aware of this. So all you need to do is click the commute button. And then that establishes the commute panel, you can go in and put in when you want to commute it. In, in our example, uh, we were talking about the beginning of 2022. Uh, the total amount that this person had to commute was a little over a million two fifty, and you also need to put in the projected uh, pension amount if it's not commuted. It has to do with the math, and then what we were able to do was put in how much was supposed to go to the uh, be, become taxable income, therefore go into the main account, main bank account, and then how much. Um, would be uh, allowable to be transferred to a lira. So, you know, I think it was 9,493, something like that. You, uh, you can see how these numbers actually adjust. So what was it, 791? So it makes it 459. 
And then when you click save, what happens is that automatically uh, VisionWorks will set up the Lyra and you can see it here. And when you go to the Lyra and it transfers into, you'll notice that the amount that can be transferred into, is, you know, is done in 2022, uh, you know, when everything is commuted. And then also if we look at net cash, what you'll see is that the net cash will show the amount of the pension plan that the uh, the DBP or the income that's you know coming out of the DBP and then of course if we look at uses it will also show uh, that amount of money coming in as other income and therefore you know do the proper tax calculation so if you've got people that um, where the DBP may be commuted, then it's really pretty straightforward. You just create the DBP, put in the projected benefit, and then all you have to do is use the commute button. And then all the math is, you know, you need to get the math, but all the math is, uh, you know, figured out and everything is set up correctly. Do you leave the DBP bill there then after you've commuted it? Yeah, what, what you do then ultimately is you choose when you're going to, you can see that the default is age 72, but you can change it here. And then all you're doing is saying, okay, that's a lira, right? The DBP commutes to a lira, um, has to, has to, the money has to remain locked in. But then at some point you choose to... Um, you know, uh, convert the lira into a lift. So you get to choose the age. And one of the things that you can do, of course, and it's, you know, provincial, but it's possible then to transfer out, you know, part of the value of the lira um, and then uh, move it into an RRSP. So you would go in and manually calculate half the value at you know, some particular age when you're going to do all of this. Um, I guess maybe we don't have a, uh, yeah. So you go in and, and that's after he turns 72. So we have to do something a little earlier. I think we don't have a, a, a rate of return applied to this. So we can just go in and apply a rate of return. Let's say that it's, you know, 5% roughly. So then what we can do is we can go in and say, okay, you know, at a certain age, we're now going to transfer, you know, which is the age we're going to convert to a lift. We're now going to see what the projected value is. And then that age, at that age, we're going to enter half the amount as a transfer out. And then we would go to the RRSP and manually enter half the amount as a transfer in, in that year. You know, unlocking half of the the uh, lira, so that we have greater access to the money. You okay with that, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Another new piece of information. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when we have an open session, you know, other things can come up. One of the other things that um, I was showing somebody yesterday, and I'm wondering if you know how well people are aware of this and I'm just going to go into Bill remember I always keep the cottage in Bill's name so I can show you know the effect of uh, him leaving it to Bill Jr. on his death predeceased Sue and what the tax implications are so all I have to do if I want to move an asset that has an ownership interest from Bill to Sue or joint or whatever I just have to go to the ownership interest. I can add Sue and then I could make it 50 50. And now the cottage has gone from uh, Bill's tab and now appears on the joint tab. By the way, this is a, a very important trick when you're dealing with uh, couples who are in the midst of divorce. Because what you can do is you can create a new solution. You can then just move the house, let's say from the joint tab to Sue's tab, if she's going to end up with the house and then anything else like that. And then all you have to do is go to the about page, delete bill. And now you've got Sue and, and any children and Sue owning the house. So all you have to do is just 
you know, change the ownership from 50-50 to 100% Sue, it'll bounce to Sue's tab. And then once you've deleted Bill, Sue will be the payer of all the expenses, et cetera. Anyway, um, we've got the cottage here and I will just do one other thing. I'm just going to add a rental property. So let's assume that this couple has a house, a cottage and a rental property. And what they want to do is they want to um, sell the house. So we would just go into the house in the buy sell panel and sell it. And then they want to convert their cottage from a secondary residence to a principal residence. So we just need to enter the conversion date. And then what they want to do is they want to convert their rental property from uh, a rental to their secondary residence because they're you know, going to designate the cottage as their primary residence. It's worth more than the rental property. So now we've gone from, we have a house, we have a cottage, we have a, a, a condo as a rental property to we've sold the house, we've converted the co cottage to our principal residence and we've converted the rental property to our secondary residence. And all you need to do is put in the conversion, the sale date of the house and the conversion date for the cottage and the rental property and all of the tax uh, implications, which are fairly extensive, are all managed in the background. And again, this is something that's not all that un uncommon uh, when people reach retirement, they often will do something like this. Um, speaking of rental properties, a lot of clients don't know the like UCC and CCA of their rental properties. Is there an easy way to just put it in where it just shows how much um, cash source they're receiving from the rental property without getting into well, those details? Well, you can do the gross rent, but the, the answer to your question is actually all you need to do is get a hold of the tax return. And if you notice here, it says refer to the previous year's T1 form uh, T7761 statement of real estate rentals area A, column 13. It's all there. Okay. Now, the reason for this, and it's very important, so we'll just use these default values, um, you know, with the depreciation and all the rest of it, is if we drill into net cash, um, and now let me, sorry, let me go back up uh, here to building land details. I'm assuming that they're depreciating the rental property. If they're not depreciating the rental property, open the list and select NA, meaning we're not claiming depreciation. But assuming that they are claiming depreciation, which I think is what most people tend to do, um, is if we, drill, if we drill into the rental property, what you see is you've got the gross rent from which you can deduct property taxes and operating expenses. So now you get the net rental income. This is the actual cash flow. But then you get to make the CCA claim. By the way, we bought it this year, so it's only half the value in the first year. Let me flip to 2022. So we've got the rent, we've got the expenses, we've got the net cash flow $16,000. That's the money we actually get in our jeans but then we have an accounting expense so that the amount that we're taxed on is only 7,300. So putting in the UCC and putting in um, you know, the numbers is important from the point of view of uh, you know, this extra cash flow. But what's also equally important is if we're not doing this, then we're not going to be doing a proper calculation should they choose to sell it or, um, you know, even if it's left to, uh, you know, children through a will, because all of these past CCA claims up to the uh, adjusted cost base of the property, they all come back into income and they're fully taxable. So, you know, if we just put in gross income, which is nice and easy to do, we're really misleading them as far as free cash flow is concerned in the here and now, and ultimately as far as the tax bill is going to be, or what the tax bill is going to be 
either on sale or death. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. They, they may not want to do it. You know, do I have to do that? But if you ask for the tax return, everything you need is on the tax return. Okay. Other um, questions? So um, next week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the My Vision of Life website. And I really encourage you to sit in and think about using this. Um, the idea is that you can start off with a plan, even a retirement plan, and then what you can do is you can export that uh, out to the My Vision of Life website and give clients login credentials, which, sorry, let me just log out first. So you give clients the address, myvisionoflife.ca. You give them login credentials, uh, their email address, and you can set up a temporary password that they can use. And they can log in uh, all the about information, you know, bills, sue the children, et cetera, that's all set up. But what they can do is they can go to the vision page and they can start to amplify on their vision. So the whole concept is uh, that their area of expertise are their values or areas of expertise are their values and the things they want to have and do in life your area of expertise is how are we going to get you from where you are to where you want to be. So nobody else has any questions. Um, we'll call it today um, done and um, look forward to seeing you uh, next week. And I hope you enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Interesting as always. Thanks. Bye.